Hi, Holly. Um, thank you for coming. How are you today? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. So I'm just going to start with a question based on your personal statement. So in your personal statement, you wrote about an essay you wrote for a competition, which was about minority influence on um, global change. So could you tell me something, maybe something interesting you learned or you read while writing that essay? Yeah, so one of the topics that I've researched as part of this essay was um, based on the theory of the augmentation principle, which is the idea that there are factors such as going through hardship or sacrifice that can impact people's perception of your behaviours and the way that you act. So an everyday life example of this could be um, if you learn that somebody to run a marathon, um, you'd be impressed by that to start with, but then if you learn that they'd done this after recovering from an injury, then you would be even more impressed by it because it's um, more difficult for them to have gone through. So I applied this principle to um, the idea of global change in the movement of the suffragettes, because a lot of them were, going, were making sacrifices such as the hunger strikes and being imprisoned for what they were doing. And this made people take them more seriously because of the sacrifices they were making, which added to the validity of their movement and convince more people to support them. That's really interesting. Thank you. So now we're going to move on to discussing the reading that you've done before this interview. So I will just share that on my screen now so you can refresh your memory. So like I said, you should have um, had a read of this sheet before the interview. So now I'm just going to ask you some questions about it. So um, first of all, what do you think they were kind of aiming to study during this experiment? So they were looking at the way that um, the monkey's ability to recognise faces develops and whether this was affected by deprivation of being exposed to different types of faces of human or monkey faces um, and how this changes after they've later been exposed to different types of faces later on and then been reintegrated into a monkey colony. Great. So what did they do then to kind of test this? So they... They had three different conditions of monkeys plus the control group. And these conditions were monkeys that had been deprived um, of exposure to faces for six months, 12 months, 24 months and zero months, which was the control group. And to measure this, they were showing them photos of monkey and human faces to see if they could discriminate between them. And they did this first straight after the, the end of their deprivation period. And then they tested them again after one month when half of them had been exposed to just monkey faces and half had been exposed just to human faces. And then they reintegrated them all into a monkey colony and ran the experiment again with all of the monkeys. Yeah, that's it. That's a really good description of what they did. So um, now we've kind of got that out of the way, I'm going to move on to show you one of the graphs of the results from that experiment and ask you to kind of talk me through it. So here's the graph. And first of all, could you describe to me what each of these graphs shows? OK, so in graph A, firstly, it's showing the results that they obtained in the first study just after all the monkeys had finished their deprivation period. And it's showing the difference or, well, the length of time they spent looking at old faces that they recognised or had been exposed to before compared with new faces that were novel that they hadn't seen before. And graph A shows that all of the monkeys showed a similar pattern in that they spent more time looking at new faces than they did at um, faces they recognised. And this was consistent between looking at human and monkey faces. Mm -hmm. And for graph B, this was the control group. So this is a group who hadn't experienced any deprivation of faces. and it shows that um, they spent a similar length of time looking at the old and new faces for humans, but they spent more time looking at the new faces compared with the old faces for monkeys, since they'd probably been exposed to more monkey faces and were more familiar with them. For C, this is showing the results from the monkeys that had then been exposed to just human faces after a month, um, after they'd previously been uh, deprived. And this shows that they had an increased length of time looking at the human faces and there was still a difference between, they looked at human faces for longer than they looked at, um, sorry, they looked at the new faces for longer than they looked at the old faces, which is not 
a difference that was shown when they were looking at the monkey faces because they were fairly similar at the time looking at the old and new faces for monkeys. Yeah. And graph D shows the same thing, but an inverse, which this was done in a condition where they were exposed to monkey faces and not human faces for a month. And they spent a similar length of time looking at the old and new human faces, but spent significantly longer looking at the new monkey faces and the old monkey faces. And the trends of both graph C and D were continued when they then redid the study after a year. They found a similar pattern um, that not much has changed and they still showed the same preference of the length of time they spent looking at human versus monkey faces. Great. OK, so what do these graphs tell us then about their ability to discriminate between different types of faces. Great, okay, so now can you tell me what these results mean in terms of the monkey's ability to discriminate different types of face? Okay, so for graph A, they were able to discriminate between both human and monkey faces because they showed a difference in the time they looked at the new and the old faces, so they were able to um, tell if it was a face they've seen before or not. Um, for graph B, they were able to discriminate between the monkey faces because they looked at the new faces for longer um, than the old faces, but they were not able to discriminate between human faces, potentially because they're not as familiar with them, because they spent a similar amount of time looking at the old and new faces. For graph C, when they've been exposed to human faces for an amount of time, they were able to discriminate between human faces because you can see that they looked at the new human faces for longer than the old human faces, but they weren't able to discriminate between the monkey faces because they looked at them for a similar amount of time. And graph D shows the same thing, but in inverse because they spent longer looking at the monkey faces, which is what they'd been exposed to previously, and a similar amount of time looking at different human faces. And the trends in both graph C and D were continued again. Um, when they redid the study a year later, they were consistent results with what they'd found a year before. Yeah, perfect. That's exactly what those results mean in terms of their discrimination abilities. So now kind of considering that and what we know about their ability to tell the difference between two human faces or two monkey faces, depending on what kind of faces they've been exposed to, what does that maybe tell you about how face processing develops and kind of the role of these stimuli in that? It would suggest that they potentially start off with some kind of innate mechanism for recognising different types of faces that might be applicable to both human and monkey faces since they were initially um, able to distinguish between human and monkey faces before they'd been exposed to either. So they must have started off with some way of distinguishing between them. But it also suggests that as they are exposed to different types of faces, they then develop an ability to distinguish between them and maybe lose their ability to distinguish between other types of face that they're not being exposed to, which would be suggested by the findings from graph C and D. Because the type of face they've been exposed to more, they have a greater ability to distinguish between than they do the face that they've not been um, exposed to as much. And it would also suggest that regardless of further exposure after a certain amount of time, this passing continues since in graph E and F, um, after a year when they'd been exposed to both human and monkey faces, they retained a similar preference to what they had done before, um, which suggests that there's a period of time in which it's more crucial that they um, develop this um, preference <laughs> okay thank you yeah i think that's a good description of what this data is kind of telling us about um face processing so i'd like you now to think about maybe a different measure that could have been tried in this experiment so when they ran this experiment they also measured um looking preferences so what they did was they showed the monkeys two images at the same time and one of them was an image of a monkey face and one of them was an image of a human face and they recorded how long they spent looking at each of those two faces within the given sort of presentation of that stimulus so what results then might you expect from that measure at these different time points so after they'd been deprived after they'd been shown a certain type of face for a month and after a year and just to kind of give you a hint 
with the monkeys that were the control monkeys that had been normally exposed to monkey faces, it was found that they had a preference for they looked longer at monkey faces than they did at human faces. So for the when this was carried out after the deprivation, immediately after the deprivation, they probably would have spent a similar amount of time looking at the human face and the monkey face because um, they've not shown a preference in this study. So I'd assume that would be continued on and they yeah they wouldn't have a preference between them but then if with the control group if they showed a preference for looking at monkey faces then that would suggest that they would show a preference for the type of face they've been exposed to more so i'd assume that after a month of being exposed to either human or monkey faces when given a choice between the two they would spend longer or they prefer looking at the same type of face that they've been exposed to more frequently. So for the monkeys that had been exposed to human faces, they would prefer looking at the human faces and vice versa. And then after a year, yeah. I would expect the same pattern to follow. Yeah, and I think that's pretty much what they found in that measure as well. So it kind of is in support of this data. OK, then, so maybe trying to is extrapolate this experiment then into humans, because obviously we're interested in finding out about how face processing develops in humans too. So obviously we couldn't use this exact paradigm in human babies because that wouldn't be ethical. But what you can do is show young human babies who are potentially a few months old pictures of monkey faces over a period of time, as well as them obviously going about their normal lives and being exposed to lots of human faces of their parents and people in the street, all that kind of stuff. So if I did take these normal human babies and just add to their life training at looking at monkey faces, if I then gave them this experiment, this discrimination task, what results might you expect to see from those babies I had trained on monkey faces and babies that were in a control group that hadn't been shown that? Well, based on the results of this experiment, I would assume that the babies who had been exposed to monkey faces um, would be able to distinguish between them much more significantly than babies who hadn't been exposed to different monkey faces. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then sort of further on from that as well, why do you think it might be useful to be able to kind of develop this better ability to discriminate the faces that you've been exposed to over sort of the early course of your life? It might be useful because um, in terms of like your attention and what you're aware of all the time, you're taking in information from all your surroundings. So it would be useful for infants or for babies to be able to distinguish between what might be important to them, what's most significantly occurring in their life, um, what they might what might appear most often and what they have to interact with the most. And it wouldn't be useful to them to have to be able to process information in the same way that they wouldn't be ex exposed to as often. Yeah, exactly. So that specialisation is quite important there, right? So my sort of final question is, do you have any criticisms of this study? So anything you think maybe they could have done better or conversely, any particular strengths? Well, the first thing that I noticed when reading through the study is the fact that it's it got a very small sample size. They're only using um, a couple of different monkeys for each condition. And this means that the results might not first be generalizable to all monkeys because there's so few of them and they, it might be subject to individual differences. Um, and also if all the monkeys were taken from the same colony, then they there might be differences between colonies as well. Also, if the purpose of the study was to learn more about human development of recognition of faces, then we can't generalize results from monkeys to humans because we have different needs and different purposes for being able to recognize faces and so the mechanism might work differently between monkeys and humans. Also a methodological issue would be the fact that in this study they use um, static images as a stimulus which isn't something that monkeys would ever be exposed to in their ordinary lives which means it lacks ecological validity because they might not respond to them in the same way that they would respond to a moving monkey face or a moving human face because they're just not the same thing and they might treat them differently. Yeah, great. You've raised some excellent points there. So that's the end of the questions that I've got for you. Do you have any questions for me before we go? No, I don't. Think so. Great. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. It was nice to meet you. Bye. Nice to meet you too. Thank you.